speaker disclosure. Uh, the topic is the wipe on the wall. I'm Sharon Ward for. I'm an independent infection prevention consultant. I am a paid consultant for metrics. This presentation makes no clinical recommendations, but it does reference recommendations pertaining to current practices. Our objectives for today are to explain the importance of disinfectants, explain why no disinfectant wipe can have every organism on its label. And I think this is an important topic. And honestly, it's been eating away at me for some time. We work hard to select the best possible disinfectant wipes to keep patients and staff safe. Unfortunately, the overwhelming number of wipes makes us second guess our choices. So I'll share some science to provide peace of mind in your choice of disinfectant wipe. Uh, the next objective will be to describe how antibiotic resistance differs from resistance to disinfectants. And this is another important point. I know there's confusion between the two that makes us question if our selected product is effective, especially against the MDROs. I get questions from IPs about this pretty often. My goal is to clarify this point based on the best available science. And then next we'll determine the best disinfectant for your facility using a questionnaire and risk assessment. And I'm not going to tell you to use a particular product, but I will provide the tools to help you make the best decision for your facility or situation. Don't be afraid to ask questions. The use of chemical disinfectants was one of the first processes implemented to reduce patient infection risk beginning in about the mid 19th century. Now, even though disinfectants have been used for a long time and we know quite a bit about their use and limitations, it's the many, many available products that makes selection more challenging than ever. Why are there so many kinds of wipes with various chemistries? And why can't one wipe do everything we need? Let's try to make some sense of disinfectant wipes. Let's talk about disinfectants and surface disinfectants. So what is a disinfectant? Well, it's a chemical that destroys or inactivates bacteria, fungi, and viruses, but not necessarily bacterial spores on inanimate surfaces. And surface disinfection is a way to inactivate pathogens on inanimate, usually hard, non-porous surfaces. Now, along with hand hygiene, surface disinfection is one of the most important measures in healthcare to limit the transmission of pathogens. Healthcare-associated infections are an important source of illness and death. HAIs account for about 1.7 million infections and about 99,000 deaths annually, yet they are the number one preventable cause of death. About 20 to 40 percent of HAIs are attributed to cross-contamination via the hands of healthcare personnel. And this contamination occurs from either direct patient contact or indirectly from touching contaminated environmental surfaces. So improving surface disinfection can contribute to a reduction in HAIs. Now, how many of you know that the EPA classifies disinfectants as antimicrobial pesticides? It's sort of surprising, right? I guess the EPA considers microorganisms pests. Now, disinfectants are divided into two major types. There's general use disinfectants, which are used in households, swimming pools, and things like water purification systems. And then there's hospital type disinfectants, those that are used in medical and dental settings. Hospital disinfectants are what we're talking about today. Now, the EPA considers a disinfectant to be a hospital disinfectant when it destroys or irreversibly inactivates infectious or other undesirable organisms, but not necessarily their spores. EPA registered hospital disinfectants must have demonstrated acceptable efficacy against two qualifying bacteria, Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staphylococcus aureus. Any additional claims need to be individually tested. Now, some issues associated with current testing have been raised by Dr. William Rutala. For example, he talks about the unrealistic contact times where he says 10 minutes is too long for hospital use, and I agree with that. He also mentions the long list of irrelevant organisms on product labels, and I strongly agree with that. Then he speaks to the test method itself about the soil load and just a non-standard test methodology, as well as other issues. So the test method itself has come into question. Now, one really important item to note is that disinfectants used in healthcare environments 
are only part of a comprehensive multi-tiered infection control program. Please don't simply rely on the disinfectant to get the job done. Make it a part of a robust cleaning and disinfection program. And speaking of cleaning, one very important part of your environmental infection control program should be cleaning. Now the definition of cleaning is the process of using water and a product like soap or a detergent to remove debris from a surface. And cleaning needs to occur before a disinfection can be achieved. So cleaning really removes the crud so disinfectants can kill the organisms. And cleaning should include the mechanical action of scrubbing or elbow grease, like this woman's doing here in the photo. It's hard work, but probably as important, if not more so, than any antimicrobial effect of the disinfectant. And here's an example of the power of cleaning. A study by the EPA found microfiber removed up to 98% of bacteria and 92% of viruses from a surface using only water. So cleaning with mechanical scrubbing leads to better disinfection because now that disinfectant can touch the surface of the object you want to disinfect. So if a safe environment for patient, staff, and visitors is your goal, focus on cleaning, then disinfection. Now, how do surfaces transmit organisms? Well, everyone that enters a healthcare facility has the potential to contribute just a little bit of themselves to an environment. Surfaces can become contaminated with microorganisms and pathogens from patients, staff, and visitors. The transfer of pathogens from environmental surfaces is largely due to hand contact with those surfaces. So it's hands touching doorknobs, tray tables, bed rails, the dreaded TV remote, or that nurse call button, those frequently touched surfaces, they can serve as pathways to infection. So touching a contaminated surface can lead to cross-contamination of patient care items, other environmental surfaces, self-contamination, and possible infection if you touch your face, mouth, or eyes. So once you touch those contaminated surfaces and don't clean your hands, you can spread those organisms to other items, other people, or even yourself. And cleaning and surface disinfection is even more important when hand hygiene compliance isn't at its best. We know that when we do our hand hygiene audits, we get some amazing numbers, 95, 98, 100%. But according to the CDC, on our best of days, 48% compliance is what we typically will see. Now, we know microorganisms can survive on surfaces for long periods of time, serving as pathways for contamination. If you look at the chart on the left of your screen, you can see the survival times of many common pathogens. And let's look at Klebsiella, um, up to 30 months. And if you look at all the other organisms, they are able to survive on surfaces for quite a long time. Now, there was a 2008 study of 36 acute care hospitals that found that less than half of all of the environmental surfaces were properly cleaned. And we know that if a room isn't thoroughly cleaned and disinfected, transmission of potential pathogens from environmental surfaces may occur. And this means that the patient that's already in that room or maybe the next patient may risk getting an infection from an improperly cleaned room. So if less than half of the surfaces are adequately cleaned and hand hygiene is performed less than half of the time, as we talked about in the previous slide, I think we have a problem. This is why cleaning and surface disinfection are so important. Now in 1939, E.H. Spalding proposed three categories of germicidal action to prevent a risk of infection associated with the use of equipment or surfaces, which we still use today. Spalding believed that if instruments and devices for patient care were placed in different classifications, according to the degree of risk for infection associated with their use, this will provide guidance on how to disinfect or sterilize these items. Now, the Spalding classification system has three categories based on risk of infection. We've got critical, which contacts sterile areas of the body or the bloodstream, semi-critical, which contact mucous membranes or non-intact skin, and non-critical, which contact intact skin. Now, environmental surfaces fall under the non-critical category because they encounter intact skin, and intact skin is an important barrier to disease acquisition. Our focus today will be on non-critical patient care items and surfaces. 
Now, this is probably a familiar slide. It shows organisms and their resistance to disinfectants. Different groups of pathogens vary in their susceptibility to disinfectants and they're grouped accordingly. You can see prions and bacterial spores are the most resistant and they're at the very top, followed by mycobacteria all the way down to vegetative bacteria and envelope viruses, which are the easiest to kill. Now, one thing I wanna point out is efficacy claims against TB qualify disinfectants as intermediate level disinfectants. Those without TB claims are low level disinfectants. And you're wondering, well, why is this important? Well, the tuberculosis claim, it has nothing to do with transmission of this organism, but it's used as a measure of potency by the EPA. Because bacteria, mycobacteria have the highest level of resistance, except for those darn spores and prions, any surface disinfectant with the tuberculosis claim on its label is considered capable of inactivating a broad spectrum of pathogens. And you can see that on this slide. It's this broad spectrum capability that's the basis for the appropriateness of using tuberculosis chemicals for surface disinfection. And this is an important consideration because no one knows what organisms reside on equipment or surfaces, right? So using a disinfectant with the broadest organism coverage reduces the number of disinfectants needed and the associated confusion around contact times, and it may also provide peace of mind. Now, this is sort of a summary of the Spalding classification system we just talked about and the pyramid that showed organism resistance to disinfectants. Low and intermediate level surface disinfectants are used to disinfect non-critical patient care equipment and environmental surfaces. Low level disinfectants destroy vegetative bacteria, some fungi and viruses, but not mycobacteria or bacterial spores. And you can see they're there to be used when there is no visible blood present. Intermediate level disinfectants kill most enveloped and non-enveloped viruses, fungi, bacteria, but not bacterial spores, and mycobacteria. They're used when visible blood is present. Now, this is just something to note. The CDC 2016 isolation guidelines and OSHA recommend the use of an intermediate level disinfectant where, and I'm quoting, blood and or body fluid secretions or excretions are likely to be present. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't see microscopic particles. And with my glasses off, I know I see even less up close. And aren't blood and or body fluid secretions or excretions likely to be present just about any place patients are or on anything they touch in a healthcare facility. As an IP, I am all about prevention. So I'd select the product with the broadest coverage. So I know I'm covering everything, whether I can see it or not. Now, because there's so many disinfectant chemistries available, it's important to have a basic understanding of disinfectant chemistry. This slide shows some of the more common chemistries. The icons indicate their use. I'm not gonna go through the entire slide, but I wanna mention some of the most common chemistries we see in disinfectants and wipes. We have our alcohols, our halogen releasing products, which are our bleaches, our peroxygens, which are our hydrogen peroxide products, and our quaternarium ammonium products, or we know them as quats. Now, when you're selecting or evaluating a disinfectant wipe, it's important to understand the pros and cons of the different chemistries. So let's start with the quat high alcohols. They have a broad spectrum of activity. They're fast acting, they're non-corrosive, non-sporicidal, and high alcohol is actually a poor cleaner. Now, alcohol is an excellent disinfectant, but it's a really poor cleaner. And that's because alcohol can fix proteins to surfaces making them more difficult to clean. So be careful of those high alcohol products. Alcohol can evaporate quickly, sometimes even faster than the listed contact time. It's flammable and it can be irritative. The next most common product we encounter are the quat low alcohols. They have a broad spectrum of efficacy. They're good cleaners. They have a mild chemistry. They are non-sporicidal and you'll see them in various contact times. Then we have our alcohol-free products, which are actually quats. Um, they're good cleaners. They have a mild chemistry. 
they're non-sporicidal, and they have limited efficacy because a quat alone doesn't have what it takes to give it that broad spectrum. So they need assistance by something else like an alcohol. Then we have our oxidation chemistries, which are our halogens. Those are bleach products. They're fast acting, they're broad spectrum, sporicidal, and they're poor cleaners because bleach isn't really a surface cleaner, but it's an oxidizing agent. So bleach reacts with surfaces and breaks chemical bonds to kill organisms. It can cause staining, irritation, and it can be corrosive. And the thing to note about bleach is that it's inactivated by protein containing material. So that surface really needs to be clean. Then we have our peroxygens, which are our hydrogen peroxide compounds. They're fast acting, broad spectrum. They break down into environmentally friendly products like water and oxygen. They can be unstable and their effectiveness decreases at low concentrations, so high concentrations are needed. And they can also have an unpleasant odor. Now, I just wanted to mention that aerosolized hydrogen peroxide has been shown to be effective against C. diff spores, so something to be aware of. So knowing some of the properties of these common disinfectants can help you when you're selecting what's right for your facility. Look for products that are good cleaners too, because the disinfectant might be able to touch the surface because the disinfectant must be able to touch the surface of what you're trying to disinfect. And if it can't, then the surface isn't properly disinfected. Now, the concept of antibiotic resistance sometimes gets confused or interpreted as disinfectant resistance. But the action of antibiotics on bacteria is different from the action of disinfectants on bacteria. But first, let's review what antimicrobial resistance is. It's the ability of microorganisms to resist the effects of the antimicrobials that are intended to kill or control them. And bacteria acquire resistance in two ways. One is through mutations that occur in the DNA of the cell during replication. And the other is through horizontal gene transfer, where an organism gives a piece of itself to another organism, like these guys are doing in this cartoon. So the action of antibiotics on bacteria is different from the action of disinfectants on bacteria. What I mean is that antibiotics are designed to inhibit the growth of bacteria, and they target a single site. It could be the bacterial cell wall, the cell membrane, or other targets involved in nucleic acid or protein synthesis. So antibiotic modes of action on bacteria work by selecting a single target site in bacteria, inhibiting a single process. It's a one-on-one -on -one approach to disrupting that bacterial cell. And this slide shows the class of antibiotics involved in each mechanism. But bacteria fight back and they find new ways to survive against antibiotics. They're amazingly clever when it comes to outsmarting antibiotics using defense strategies called resistance mechanisms. Bacteria can develop new cell processes that avoid using the antibiotics target. They can change or destroy the antibiotic with enzymes, which are proteins that break down the drug, like you see with our ESBLs. They can restrict access by changing the entryways or limiting the number of ways the antibiotic get, get into the cell. They can change the antibiotic's target so the drug can't fit and do its job. And they transport compounds outside of the cell, which they seem as toxic. Um, and this is by a process called efflux. But this doesn't work with disinfectants. Now, we know microorganisms can adapt to a variety of environmental, physical, and chemical conditions. And one example of bacterial adaptation is sporulation, like in C. diff. The spore coat acts as a barrier to disinfectants. That's why we need a disinfectant like bleach or a hydrogen peroxide parasitic acid combo to kill that tough spore. Another bacterial adaptation is biofilm formation, but resistance is the wrong term. The correct term is tolerance. And tolerance is defined as developmental or protective effects that permit microorganisms to survive in the presence of a disinfectant. Now, remember when I said the action of antibiotics on bacteria is different from the action of disinfectants on bacteria? This is why. Disinfectants can act on microorganisms in two ways. 
They can cause growth inhibition. And those would be products that are labeled as static. And you've probably seen them, bacteri bacteriostatic, fungostatic, things like that. The other way is to cause lethal action. And products that are labeled as cidal, bactericidal, fungicidal, variocidal, tuberculocidal, these cause lethal action. Now, the main objective of hospital disinfectants is lethal action. It's that cidal. And disinfectants are complex formulations with active and inert ingredients. And it's due to these complex formulations that disinfectants have various mechanisms of action on bacteria that cause different types of damage. They can rupture the cell membrane, cause loss of permeability, uh, cause the cell membrane to leak, and um, lots of other things. So unlike antimicrobials that are selectively toxic and generally have a single target site in bacteria, disinfectants are considered nonspecific antimicrobials because they have a variety of bacterial toxic effect mechanisms or target sites. And they have a broader spectrum in the types of organisms they're effective against. Now this diagram shows the various disinfectant compounds and their target cell location. So looking at this slide, you can see the various multiple sites that disinfectants targets. So disinfectants double team bacteria because disinfectants have various mechanisms of action on bacteria. Is anyone thinking about rotating disinfectants? Well, rotation of disinfectants was endorsed in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries to prevent the development of bacterial resistance. Now, the argument was that one disinfectant should be replaced by another that has a different mode of action. However, this recommendation was conceived from experience with antibiotics that doesn't apply to disinfectants. So don't rotate your disinfectants. Now, the concept of disinfectant tolerance is really important. So I want you to understand this. Anti antimicrobials are selectively toxic. They have a single target site in bacteria. They have a one-on-one -on -one approach to attacking bacteria. Disinfectants have a variety of bacterial toxic mechanisms or target sites and a broader spectrum in the types of organisms they're effective against. Disinfectants double team the bacteria. For these reasons, bacteria don't become resistant to disinfectants like antibiotics do. Now, Common disinfectants are used at concentrations that far exceed the required minimum concentration to achieve that microbiocidal action. So a small increase in tolerance, while it's gonna be really important to an antimicrobial, has little relevance to the effectiveness of a disinfectant. And there are no data available that show antibiotic resistant bacteria are less sensitive to disinfectants than antibiotic sensitive bacteria. Now, does the use of disinfectants cause the development of disinfectant tolerant organisms? Evidence and reviews indicate enhanced tolerance to disinfectants can be developed in response to disinfectant exposure if the concentration of the active ingredient is too low to be effective. Now, this can happen when you use unregulated products or through mixing errors or improper handling and storing of dilutable disinfectants or by not following the, that IFU correctly. Reports of resistance and tolerance sometimes have additional issues like inadequate cleaning or ineffective infection control practices, which can impact those study results. Now, we still need to do research on disinfectant resistance, but one thing is clear. Bacteria do not become resistant to disinfectants in the same way they do to antimicrobials. So maybe we should stop worrying. Well, we've reviewed some basics about the, what disinfectants are, their purpose, and their chemistry. But to fully understand disinfectants, we need to understand some basic microbiology. Now, microorganisms are found on the inner and outer surfaces of the human body and also in soil, water, and air. And we don't really pay much attention to them, but they're all around us, sometimes unfavorably when they cause decay of materials or spread diseases and sometimes favorably when they ferment sugar to wine and beer, cause bread to rise, add flavor to cheeses, and produce antibiotics and insulin. So microbiology is the study of the biology of microscopic organisms, bacteria, viruses, fungi, algae, and protozoa. 
Now, as IPs, we deal a lot with microorganisms, mainly bacteria and viruses, and some medically important fungi too. Bacteria cells are called prokaryotic because they lack a nucleus. They're a unicellular organism, meaning they're single cell. They're larger than viruses, so they're visible under a light microscope. They exist in four major shapes. There's the rod, the caucus, the spiral, and the curve shape. Most bacteria have a peptidoglycan cell wall, which is composed of sugars and amino acids, and it's a rigid cell wall. Bacteria have a genome that contains DNA and RNA, which is a complete set of all the information they need to, de to develop and grow within their cell wall. Now, bacteria can reproduce by themselves. It's mainly by binary fission, which is when a cell grows and then it splits. Viruses, on the other hand, are non-cellular biological bodies that don't have a cellular structure. But what they do have is a protein coat instead. We learned all about protein codes with um, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, visible under only an electron microscope, and viruses typically have spherical, rod-shaped, or helically shaped heads. They're called capsids. And some viruses, such as bacteriophages, have complex shapes like this guy over here that looks like, I don't know, a spider with a weird head on it. Now, although viruses are classified as microorganisms, they're not considered living organisms because they can't reproduce outside a host cell and they can't metabolize on their own. Viruses need a living host to reproduce. Now for this presentation, the focus is on bacteria. All vegetative bacteria, and that's the active form, have the same bacterial cell structure. The cell wall comes in direct contact with the environment and it provides protection from it. Remember, it's a rigid cell wall. It also helps it maintain its shape and it assists some cells in attaching to other cells or avoiding antimicrobial medications. The difference in the cell wall structure is a major feature used in classifying bacteria. Now, taxonomy is the classification of living organisms. Bacterial classification is one of three components of taxonomy. And bacteria are classified to distinguish one organism from another and to group similar organisms according to shared characteristics. And this is one part of establishing taxonomic ranks, which we'll talk about later. Now, there's several ways to classify bacteria. The first is by the shape. It could be a rod, um, a cocci, spiral, or curved. The next is the Gram reaction, which is based on the cell wall composition, which we'll talk about later. Now, in a clinical setting, we're all familiar with the gram stain. It's usually the first test to begin classifying bacteria, and it's one of the most crucial stain techniques in microbiology. It gets its name from the Danish bacteriologist Hans Christian Gram, who introduced it in 1882, and he used it mainly to identify organisms that cause pneumonia. It's used to help see bacteria under the microscope and classify them into two large groups, gram negative and gram positive and the color is based on the structure of that bacterial cell wall. The next is growth, and that could be growth based on various temperature requirements and also growth on certain media that's used in the lab, like blood agar, chocolate agar, and McConkie agar, just some examples. We also want to know um, how they grow at certain atmospheres or what their oxygen requirements are. So we have our aerobes, which need oxygen, are obligate anaerobes, which don't need oxygen, the microaerophiles, which prefer reduced oxygen, and then we have our facultative anaerobes, which can go either way, oxygen or no oxygen. And just to be different, we've got our capnophiles, which like increased CO2. Next, we wanna know if they produce spores. That's a yes, if they make endospores, and a no, if they don't. And then we move on to our biochemical tests which are reactions to identify to species level, like oxidase, catalase, coagulase, and there's a whole bunch more. Then we can type the bacteria, and we do uh, bacterial strain typing, which is a way to identify a bacterial species at the strain level based on its characteristics. Um, in people, there's things that are called phenotype, which could be height, weight, and hair color. And in bacteria, the phenotype could be the shape or what it looks like grown on different agar. So strain typing is used to differentiate strains based on genetics, which is the genotype, 
or observable characteristics, which are the phenotype. Now, where I worked, we used pulse field gel electrophoresis, PFGE, to strain type during outbreaks. And there's other methods you could use too. And we can also do serologic typing, which is testing based on differences in microbial surfaces. So this is how we classify bacteria. Now, all gram-negative bacteria have a cell wall composed of a thin peptidoglycan layer. That's that purple layer, which does not take up the primary stain. So gram-negative organisms appear pink or red under a microscope. All gram-positive bacteria have a thick peptidoglycan layer, which retains the primary stain and appears purple-brown under a microscope, which is why gram-positive organisms appear purple. Now, just to confuse you, there's also gram variable, which means they stain irregularly with a mix of pink and purple. And organisms that do that are Acinetobacter, Bacillus, and Clostridium, just to name a few. And you're probably wondering about mycobacteria. Well, they can't be stained by the gram stain because they have a high lipid content, so the stain can't penetrate. So acid fast staining is used to stain mycobacteria. So thank your laboratorians for the great job they do identifying microorganisms. It is complicated. Phew, that was a lot of concepts to take in, so let's review. We talked about how bacteria and viruses are different. We saw that the bacterial cell wall is the same, bacterial cell, excuse me, is the same for all bacteria. And we learned that being gram positive or gram negative helps begin to classify bacteria and that's called taxonomy. So taxonomy is the study of living organisms like animals, plants, microorganisms, and humans to classify them in different categories. And classifying bacteria based on their similarities or shared characteristics is called bacterial taxonomy. It establishes relationships between groups of organisms because organisms with similar properties are grouped together and separated from those that are different. Now, bacterial taxonomy has three components, nomenclature, classification, and identification. And nomenclature is simply assigning a name to a species, and that seems to change all the time. Classification, which we talked about earlier, is the grouping of organisms based on shared characteristics, some of which are physical, like their shape, and some are biochemical, like how they react in those biochemical tests. Now, identification uses the features of an organism to determine where it belongs in a classification scheme. Taxonomic ranks are a way to establish, to organize information about organisms by determining relatedness or similarity. And each smaller grouping consists of organisms that share specific features in common. And each grouping becomes more and more restrictive as to who can be a member. Now, this chart shows Groupings are taxonomic ranks. And starting at the top is the highest, most diverse level. That's the domain. All living organisms are grouped into three domains, primarily based on cell type. And bacteria are one of these domains. So in a clinical setting, we're mostly concerned with the last four ranks, family, genus, species, and sometimes strain. And as you move down the taxonomic ranks, the organisms are more similar physically phenotypically, and genetically, genotypically. Now, I hope I haven't lost you. You're probably wondering where am I going with this, but just remember increasing similarity. And this is an important concept, and I want you to really think about it as we talk about this slide. Now, I almost became cross-eyed building this slide, which shows similarity among some of the gram-negative bacteria. Now, remember, as we move down the taxonomic ranks, the organisms share more characteristics, becoming more similar. So let's look at the family Pseudomonadaceae and the genus Pseudomonas. It has 140 species. And if we think about the species Pseudomonas originosa, it has 22 strains. Let's move to the genus Acinetobacter, which has over 50 species and hundreds of strains. Now, under the order Enterobacteriales, you'll find the family Enterobacteriaceae. In the family Enterobacteriaceae, you'll see some of the organisms we encounter in the clinical setting listed. Now, this family has over 30 genera, 
and over 120 species. So I've only listed a few examples here. Let's look at Klebsiella. Klebsiella has seven species. Klebsiella pneumoniae is one of those species, and that organism has over 150 strains. The genus Enterobacter has 22 species. The species E. cloacae has over 13 strains. The genus Escherichia, only eight species, but over 700 strains. See how these organisms are grouped, and the groupings are based on relatedness or similar characteristics. They are more alike than they are different. Now, one more example, because I really want to get you thinking. So let's look at the bacterial taxonomy of some gram-negative MDROs. Do you see anything familiar? Okay, now remember, these MDROs have the same cell structure and cell wall. They are more similar as you move down the taxonomic ranks. Now we know that CRE stands for carbapenem resistant enterobacterales, and enterobacterales is a taxonomic order. Now, these organisms are still classified based on their bacterial taxonomic rank, but they also happen to demonstrate resistance to antibiotics, which we talked about earlier. And we now know that the action of antibiotics and disinfectants on bacteria is different. Now, the CDC identifies disinfectants that are effective against the species Staphylococcus aureus, or the genus Staph, as also being effective against MRSA. Applying the same thought process, if the disinfectant is effective against the genus Escherichia and all its species, shouldn't that include the MDROs in the genus too? According to the CDC, this is important, no data are available that show that antibiotic resistant bacteria like the CREs and ESBLs are less sensitive to disinfectants than antibiotic sensitive bacteria as long as you're following the IFU correctly. So are we worrying unnecessarily about having every MDRO on the disinfectant label? Something to think about. So my point is there is no way any disinfectant manufacturer can test their product against all organisms. For example, family Enterobacteriaceae has over 30 genera and over 120 species and uh, lots and lots of strains. Now, if you follow the science, the Spalding hierarchy of organism resistance, the bacterial taxonomic ranks that show organisms are more similar as you move down from the family to the species level, and the fact that all vegetative bacteria have the same cell wall, is testing of each organism needed? Is stating a product claim as effective against the family Enterobacteriaceae or maybe effective against the genus, all we need as long as we test the harder, hardest to kill organisms. So this sort of grouping approach was applied to viruses when the EPA developed its emerging viral pathogens program during the COVID pandemic. It allowed disinfectant manufacturers that submitted data to the EPA demonstrating efficacy against difficult to inactivate viruses to be able to use their product against viruses not identified on the product label. So the EVP program used the science of similarity among different difficult to inactivate viruses and applied it to untested novel viruses. Maybe the same approach should apply to bacteria, something more to think about. Now, this slide shows all the main points I want you to think about. These are questions I've been asking myself. Have we gone too far in expecting to see every organism on the canister or master label? Am I the only one who feels like it's a contest to get the most organisms listed on the label? Are we selecting the disinfectant based on the number of kill claims? You know, some pathogens listed aren't even spread through contact with surfaces or medical equipment. And some are veterinary or aquatic organisms. How did this happen? Do we even need them all listed on the label since the organisms have increasing similarities both phenotypically and genotypically? If we're able to kill Enterobacteriaceae, are we also getting those organisms all the way down to the species level? Can we rely on the science of relatedness and similarity to help us understand that no disinfectant wipe can have every organism on its label and does it really need to? 
Can following the science that most disinfectants are able to kill most organisms and understanding there are no data available that show that antibiotic resistant bacteria are less sensitive to disinfectants than antibiotic sensitive bacteria. And if we combine this with, with a robust cleaning program, can this help us stop second guessing that the wipe on the wall can get the job done? More to think about. So let's talk a little bit about selecting a surface disinfectant. Now, this selection process can be overwhelming and confusing, and we know the perfect product for healthcare disinfection hasn't been developed just yet. There's a wide variety of surface disinfectants that offer a range of characteristics, so it's important to understand them and prioritize them when selecting the wipe that's right for your facility. These are a few of the properties that I consider key when evaluating surface disinfectants. Broad spectrum, it should include kill claims for pathogens that are the common causes of HAIs. That's Staph aureus, it's Enterococcus, it's E. coli, it's Coag negative Staph, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Klebsiella and Enterobacter species. These organisms account for 79% of HAIs. When you're looking at spectrum, also include organisms responsible for outbreaks and pathogens that are unique to your facility. And also consider an intermediate level hospital grade disinfectant, the one with the TB claim, because TB is the EPA's benchmark organism for potency, and it's effective against a broad range of organisms. Remember that spalding hierarchy of organism resistance to disinfectants. And also think about the future because we're not done with pandemics yet. And consider a product with the emerging viral pathogens claim. Those are organisms, that, those products you can find on the EPA list queue. The next is look at your contact time. Turnaround time in healthcare is important because no facility likes to keep patients waiting for beds. So consider a product with a reasonable contact time. But understand that contact times can vary even within a product. For example, a product might say it has a one minute contact time, but for TB, it could be five minutes. And this is due to the chemistry of that product, which we learned about, and the need for a longer contact time to kill a resistant organism like TB. So look for a product with a universal contact time, which means one time to kill everything listed on the label and read those label claims and contact times carefully. Now your wipe should remain wet and keep surfaces wet long enough to meet the listed contact time with a single application. And this is sometimes an issue with high alcohol products, so be aware of this. Safety, uh, your product should be non-toxic. It shouldn't be harmful, irritating to the user, visitor, and patients. It shouldn't cause allergic symptoms, especially asthma and dermatitis. So look at the signal words for the toxicity reigning. Uh, the highest toxicity is labeled as danger, and then they move down, warning, caution, and no signal word. Flammability is an issue, so choose, choose a product with the lowest flammability rating. And flammability is more of an issue when you're introducing a product into your ORs, where there's things like lasers and flashing happening. PPE, most facilities prefer a product that requires the least amount of PPE, but it still provides protection from exposure to adverse health effects. And what about special handling and storage? Uh, something like parasitic acid comes to mind where you need to have special disposal, um, make sure you're wearing some kind of eye protection and chemical resistant gloves. Surface compatibility. This, your products should not corrode instruments and metallic surfaces and really shouldn't cause deterioration of healthcare materials. Another thing to consider is the pH. I prefer products that are more neutral because I think they're kinder and gentler to the surfaces I'm trying to clean and disinfect. Your product should be easy to use. The easier it is to use, the more likely it is for staff to achieve compliance and really apply the product to all hand contact surfaces. And it should have clear, easy to follow directions. Now, odor could have an acceptable odor by users and patients, and that's I think what comes to mind for me is bleach. Some people love it, some people hate it, or no odor. Cleaner should have good, good cleaning properties. Remember, you can't adequately disinfect a surface if it hasn't been thoroughly cleaned. And you'll find certain products have chemical ingredients that do a better job cleaning than others. And we learned about that. 
In addition to considering those chemical ingredients, also consider how well that actual substrate material, that wipe itself, cleans. The ability to clean is as important as the disinfectant. And one more thing I want to mention is disinfectant persistence. Persistence or sustained antimicrobial activity of the disinfectant, it would be desirable, and there are some products out there that offer this. However, the use of these products hasn't demonstrated a reduction in HAIs compared with disinfectants without persistence. But I'm sure we'll see more to come on this issue. Now, just to get you started, this is an example of some questions you might want to ask when you're selecting your disinfectant product. And this is ideal for your facility. Use the scoring to help you pick the highest rated product based on the total score. Um, this document will be available to you so you can edit it and tailor it to your needs. Just click on the link on the left. This is a copy of an AMI document. It's a risk assessment for low and intermediate level disinfection. Um, it, it'll help you get started to develop policies and procedures and identify the risk of inadequate or improper use of low and intermediate level disinfectants that could cause disinfection failure or other issues like material incompatibility. Again, if you click on the link, um, you'll be able to edit and tailor this document to your needs. Both the questionnaire and the risk assessment, they can help you with product selection and purchase decisions. Now, IPs. No need to do this alone. Disinfection selection is a team sport, so get all the stakeholders involved and use your infection control plan to help you. So disinfection of non-critical environmental services and equipment is an essential component of an infection prevention program. Improving surface cleaning and disinfection reduces HAIs. Your wipe on the wall should be an EPA registered hospital disinfectant. Bacteria are only capable of developing tolerance to certain types of disinfectants if the concentration of the active ingredient is too low to kill effectively. Don't use unregulated products and follow those IFUs. Your wipe on the wall should be effective against pathogens that are the most common causes of HAIs and relevant to outbreaks, unit closures, and the unique pathogens in your facility. Try not to be influenced by the number of kill claims and read those kill claims carefully. Don't be fooled by labels filled with irrelevant organisms that aren't spread through contact with surfaces or medical equipment. Let your infection control plan with organisms of concern for a unit or area where you may have some issues, guide your selection. When evaluating the variety of available disinfectants, prioritize what properties are important for your facility. Give that disinfection selection questionnaire a try to select the best product and use the risk assessment to help sort through the pros and cons and mitigate risk, tailor both to your facility. Spalding disinfectant hierarchy and bacterial taxonomy can provide an understanding of similarity among bacteria, since no surface disinfection manufacturer can test their product against all organisms. Follow the science of similarity. Maybe knowing how bacteria are organized and grouped by similarities can provide an understanding of efficacy. Disinfectant manufacturers are limited by what's on their labels, and they're not allowed to infer claims. No data are available that show that antibiotic resistant bacteria are less sensitive to disinfectants than antibiotic sensitive bacteria, as long as you're following the IFU correctly. Bacteria do not become resistant to disinfectants in the same way they do to antimicrobials because the action of antibiotics on bacteria is different from the action of disinfectants on bacteria. Antibiotics attack bacteria on a single site. Disinfectants attack bacteria on multiple sites. You now have the tools and knowledge to select the best wipe on the wall available to keep non-critical patient care equipment and surfaces free from contamination. The wipe on the wall can get the job done. Thanks for attending this presentation. 